This week we have another double Parsha, Parshas Tazria and Parshas Mitzorah. Parshas Tazria has only 67 verses. It's a brisk Parsha. There's seven mitzvos, and the content, the subject matter of this week's Parsha is somewhat unique because the sole subject is the idea of purity and impurity. It begins with the purity and impurity stemming from childbirth. A woman has a boy, a woman has a girl. There's certain laws governing purity and impurity once the baby's been born. And then chapter 13, which is the rest of the parsha, is dedicated to the laws of purity and impurity stemming from saras. Saras is some sort of skin malady that is a physical representation of a spiritual ailment, of a spiritual illness. Now, I think it's a good way to kind of introduce ourselves to the subject of purity and impurity. We could look at the very first Rashi's commentary on the Parsha. The Rashi gives a puzzling statement from our sages. He says that if you go back to Genesis and you look at the order of creation, you'll notice that all the animals are created first, and the very last thing the very last entity to be created in Genesis is mankind. So you have the animals created first and then mankind. Therefore, says Rashi, we first have the laws of the animals. So at the end of last week's parasha, we have the laws of which animals are kosher, which animals are not kosher. And once the laws of the animals are done, just like they were created before men, their laws are taught before men. And once we concluded the laws of the animals, we're told the laws of the humans. Very intriguing idea that there's a certain parallel between Genesis and the creation of man and animals and Leviticus and the laws governing the purity and impurity of humans and animals. And I think it's kind of odd, you know, what is the connection? What's the connection between Genesis, between the creation of man and the animal kingdom and these laws, the laws governing the purity and impurity of animals and humans? So there's an interesting statement from the Maharal, and he says that when we have Torah, we have laws governing animals, laws governing humans, that in effect is the completion of creation. And that's a deep point here. When we were created, we were created with imperfections. And you know what? Animals were also created with imperfections. And therefore, when we have laws governing humans and animals, These are the laws, these are the tools given to us, so to speak, to complete creation, to finish off Genesis, and to achieve what the desire of creation was, is that it should be a hybrid, so to speak. God creates, we perfect with Torah, and therefore there's a natural connection between Genesis and Leviticus, between the creation of animals and men, and between the laws of purity and impurity of animal men, which is their perfection. As an aside, there is a dizzying amount of time and content that's dedicated to the laws of purity and impurity to these laws of contamination. So like we said, this is Parsha, we have the impurity of a mother after having a baby and the impurity from the tsaras, from this spiritual disease with physical manifestations on a person's body, a person's garments, a person's house. There are all kinds of other states of purity and impurity. So the most impure thing is a dead human body, there's dead carcasses, women who menstruate, there's the major zava, the minor zava, these are various irregularities in their cycle. A man who has a seminal emission has a degree of impurity, there's a major and minor zava for a man, other forms of emissions when someone's ill, and there's all kinds of laws, draconian laws, related to how A person who has these impurities has to behave. How someone with these impurities, how can they could be remedied? You know, the oral Torah is broken down into the six orders of Mishnah. And one of those orders is the, is the order called Taharos, which deals with impurity and purity. So in effect, you have like 15 to 16% of all of Torah dedicated to these laws. And for us in modern times, I will say, these ideas seem very distant. It doesn't seem really tangible or applicable. Now, there are some cases where these laws are very much applicable. So, for example, the Torah tells us that a Kohen, a priest, is not allowed to come into contact with dead people, meaning they can't visit cemeteries. And 
the laws governing purity and impurity are much more than just touching the dead body, but being in close proximity or even being in the same structure. So if you're in the same building as a dead body, there's this idea that this impurity permeates the entire structure, the entire edifice in which it is contained. And therefore, if you're a Kohen and you're in a building and you find out that someone died, you have to run away out of the building, escape quickly because you can't be in that same building. So for example, this extends even further. In Jerusalem, where I used to live, there was a cemetery that was adjacent to a to a street, and there was a sign on the street because there was trees overhanging on both the cemetery and the street next to it. A coin because of the laws of impurity governing a uh, a structure, those would preclude the coin from walking under the trees, even though he's not in the cemetery. But because the trees are covering both the cemetery and the street next to it. Walking under the tree would be prohibited. And this actually extends further. You know, someone's in a hospital. The entire hospital, as long as it's connected, they could even be in separate buildings. But if there's some sort of connection between the two, that would unite those buildings as one halachic structure. And if there's a dead body in one of those buildings, then the Kohen can't be in the entire building complex. So those are some laws governing a Kohen and how they have to relate with dead bodies with cemeteries today. This was a very big deal when the temple was extant, when the sacrifices were in existence. Everyone had to always know the state of purity that they were in, what they could touch, what they cannot touch, what they could eat, where they can go. And even today, if you walk uh, in Israel and you go to the Kotel, you go to the Western Wall and you want to go onto Temple Mount, there's big signs saying that according to Jewish law, Jews are not allowed to go there. And the reason for that is that the temple grounds retained their purity requirements. And therefore, for someone to walk up there, you would have to be in a state of purity, in a state of purity that we probably cannot achieve today because the only way to undo the purity of coming into contact with dead bodies is via the red heifer that we'll, re- that we'll meet later on in the Torah. And we, because we don't have a red heifer, we can't become fully cleansed and therefore we cannot come really too close to temple grounds. So these ideas are not very applicable, but there are some isolated instances where they are applicable. But I think even more broadly, on a philosophical level, the whole notion of purity and impurity seems quite foreign. You know, we associate purity with cleanliness, with hygiene. It's maybe even hard for us to come up with good definitions about what these things even mean. And you know, we had last week the laws of the kosher foods, and this week with the law, laws of purity and impurity. These are all like spiritual ideas captured in physical things. You have the physical food, it's a piece of meat, and one piece of meat's kosher, and one piece of meat's not kosher. What's the difference between the two? It's not necessarily on a physical level, a physical plane, a physical realm, it's on the spiritual realm. You have someone who has this spiritual ailment, they're perfectly healthy, they're perfectly clean. There's nothing wrong with them from our perspective, yet the Torah says they may be impure. So what's a way to understand the general principle of purity and impurity? And I think, you know, the the Parsha begins with a woman having a, a baby, which is a wonderful thing. It's a holy thing. You're bringing a soul into the world. Is there anything greater than having a child? Yeah, the Torah says that if she has a male, she's impure for seven days. If she has a female, she's impure for 14 days. Why would having a baby render someone impure? Now, in addition, the bulk of the laws of impurity and purity relate only to Jews, and many of them are applicable only in the land of Israel. Clearly, if purity and impurity from the Torah's perspective were about cleanliness, they wouldn't only apply to us. And finally, a third question to ponder is the idea of tsaras, which is going to comprise the bulk of our parsha. Tsaras, we're told in the Talmud, it is a physical illness that comes because of a certain sin. And primarily the sin of Lashonara, the sin of evil talk, of talking negatively about other people. Why would tsaras not be prevalent today. After all, people speak Lashon Ara, people speak negatively about other people, and right away, according to the Torah, they should sprout immediately Tsaras 
It should just show up on their skin, on their garments, on their house. Why is it not prevalent today? So a general rule of thumb that we're told by our commentators, by the sages, of what purity and purity is and what they portend, what they represent, is that purity is life, is vitality, is potential, and impurity is the lack of life and the lack of potential. So for example, we start off with the mother who just had a baby. So if you look at a pregnant woman, then what do you have? You have two souls. You have the soul of the mother, and then you have the soul of the baby. What happens when the baby's born? So it's fantastic. The baby's nothing wrong with the baby. There's nothing wrong with the mother either. But if you look at the mother just on a purely spiritual plane, if we could put on goggles that showed you just a soul, and you looked at this person, you would see how many souls? You'd see two souls, the soul of the mother, the soul of the baby. If those were your only goggles, and then you see the woman a week later, and she's had a baby, how many souls do you see? You only see one soul. So from a purely spiritual perspective, there was a massive diminishing of the life, of the vitality, of the holiness of the mother. Of course, it's not a bad thing. It's a fantastic thing. But that's the general principle that there's an absence of holiness or there is a reduction of holiness. There was holiness. There was life within her. Of course, the life is hopefully flourishing outside of her. But within her, there was a reduction of life, a reduction of potential. Therefore, it's a loss of spiritual vitality, and that is the definition of impurity. It's not dirtiness. It's not nothing wrong. There's no maybe contamination is the wrong word, but impurity by definition is the reduction of spiritual life, of vitality, of opportunity for greatness, of holiness. A woman menstruates. Well, what's that? Nothing wrong with it. It's very natural, but there was potential for life that has now been diminished, has now been lost. A man has a seminal emission. Again, same pattern. There's life, there's vitality, there's opportunity, there's potential for life, and now that has been reduced, that has been diminished. Someone is alive, they're alive. What is the least pure thing in the world? The most impure thing in the world is a dead body. Why? That that thing was alive, there was a soul in it, and the soul has departed. Death is a very normal thing. In fact, every person that's ever lived has died. Of course, besides for the ones that are still alive. But everyone, it's not, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Moses died, right? Abraham died. Death is a very normal part of the human experience. But when someone's alive, meaning their soul is still in their body, there is a soul in this body. If you look at that same body, the cadaver, after the soul has departed it, the soul is gone. And as a result, that is the definition of impurity. Again, not dirtiness. It's not that it's unhealthy, it's not that it's unclean, it's not that there's something wrong, it's just a reduction of holiness, reduction of, of the soul, a reduction of life, a reduction of vitality. And the Ramban, in a very famous essay here, in chapter 13, verse 47, he points out, again, that the idea of Taras is not something natural at all. In fact, he points out that these afflictions, they contaminate Garments, you know, leprosy is a skin disease that still exists, but that doesn't extend to clothing or to someone's house. But this is a spiritual reflection that is manifested in a physical world. And he explains that this is only when the Jewish people are perfect. When the presence of God is upon them, it's real their spiritual life is tangible. Those goggles that we talked about, those spiritual goggles are present. They're in the land of Israel and exclusively in the land of Israel. Their spiritual life is heightened. Those people, when they're living in a spiritual way, in a spiritual manner, the spiritual realm is more palpable and therefore reductions in spiritual degrees are more felt. Us today, yes, we still have Lashon HaRa, sadly, but what we don't have is that same heightened level of spiritual acuity, and therefore we don't sense it. It's not, it's, where it's less perceptible to us, and therefore we don't have Taras today as a immediate consequence of Lashon Hara or other sins. And I think we can look at this general principle as a continuation of the laws of eating kosher foods and avoiding non-kosher foods. There is this, a certain spiritual sensitivity that we have, that we've adopted, that we've absorbed, that we 
have earned as a result of us being the chosen people, the kingdom of priests and the holy nation, once we're at that heightened level because of our spiritual acuity, therefore we have all these additional laws. Later on in Leviticus, we're going to read about the land of Israel itself. The land of Israel is a holy land. When we say holy, we mean spiritual. Of course, it's also a physical land. You can plant and you can have agriculture and build roads and aqueducts, whatever. But it's a, a, a physical land that also has spiritual power to it. And we're told in later on in Leviticus that if people sin, the land itself will expel us. It will vomit us out. And Rashi tells us, that gives us an analogy. You have a prince. The prince is used to eating the finest of foods. And then you give him something which is a little bit underdone. It's a little bit raw. They'll right away get stomach poisoning and they'll start vomiting. Whereas if you take a peasant who's not used to the most delicate of foods, their stomach is a little bit more resolute. It's a little bit more capable of absorbing all kinds of stuff and therefore, it doesn't expel, it doesn't vomit when the food is not not just so. Similarly, you know, if we go to the other lands, other lands are not as sensitive. They're not spiritually sensitive to sin. Whereas the land of Israel, it's like the stomach, it's like the gut of, of the prince. It's spiritually potent. And therefore, to the degree of spiritual potence is the degree of spiritual sensitivity to things that are not spiritually okay. Jewish people, we're elevated spiritually. Consequently, we have to behave in a higher level. And therefore, the foods that are wrong spiritually, so to speak, we have to avoid them because it's dangerous for us. Non-Jews, it's not dangerous for them. They're not as spiritually developed as we are. That's the principle that applies with kosher or non-kosher food. And that's the same idea over here, that because we have a heightened degree of holiness and spirituality, therefore, we have a heightened degree of the laws of purity and impurity, the laws of our soul, the laws of that are, that are reflective of the spiritual state of our soul. Perhaps as an example, we could say, you know, if someone is wearing a garment made of sackcloth, it's very hard to see, you know, if there's a stain on the garment. Whereas if someone's wearing the nicest, choicest, finest linen, silk garments, the slightest imperfection, the slightest smudge, the slightest discoloration is already noticed. Again, the higher degree of purity, the more sensitivity you have to have for things that are impure. You take a diamond. It's shiny. It's beautiful. The most beautiful diamond, what do we do? We take a loop and we magnify them. And we examine them very, very, very critically to see if there's any slight blemishes, any slight imperfections. So in effect, the laws of purity and impurity are a reflection and a consequence of being holy, of being special, of being more spiritually developed. The Rambam tells us, Maimonides tells us, in chapter 5 of the Laws of the Foundations of Torah, that there is a concept called Chil Hashem, which means desecration of God's name. And he gives us the laws governing uh, desecration of God's name in general. And then he adds that every person, they have to behave in the degree that is commensurate to their spiritual stature. As someone upgrades other areas of life, they have to upgrade everything else in tandem. If you're someone who is spiritually advanced, you have to live above and beyond the letter of the law, above and beyond the standard practice. You have to behave in a scintillatingly pure and moral fashion. Similar idea that we see over here, the holiness that we inherently have is manifested in these very delicate laws governing the purity and impurity, the minute changes of the spiritual state of our soul. Let's go back to our introductory Rashi. Rashi tells us, that there's a connection between Genesis, creation of animals and man, and the laws of purity and impurity of animals and man. I think now we understand the connection quite deeply. Man was created last. If you look at all those reasons, they are the four reasons that were that we mentioned from the Talmud. All those four reasons are reflections of man's superiority over animals. We are more special. We are the guests of honor, so to speak, in God's world. We're the ones who do mitzvos. We're the ones, of course, who have the challenges because we could also go the other way. We could also reject God. But that too is a reflection of the fact that we are created in the image of God, that we have free will, free choice. 
Therefore, it makes a lot of sense that as a reflection of our specialness, as a reflection of the fact that we are elevated, we have these very draconian laws of purity because they are governing only someone who is special, only someone who is living in a very heightened state of spirituality. So that's a long way to introduce the idea of purity and impurity that is the dominant theme of our Parsha. So the Parsha begins, speak to the children of Israel, a woman conceives, gives birth to a male, she should be contaminated, she should be impure for a seven-day period. And then on the eighth day, we read in verse number three, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So it begins with the birth of a male and a female, but it interjects with the laws of circumcision. The woman is impure for seven days, and on the eighth day, the child is circumcised. What is the connection between the seven day of impurity and the eighth day upon which the child is circumcised? The Talmud tells us, in the book of Nita, page 31, why did the Torah declare that a child is circumcised on day eight? Because we don't want a situation that everyone is happy because the child's been circumcised. It's a huge party. Everyone's happy, but the father and mother are sad. Why? Because the mother is still suffering, so to speak, from the laws of impurity. Therefore, the Torah waits, so to speak, so everyone could be happy after seven days of impurity. You have the eighth day. The woman's pure now. And the child can be circumcised and everyone can be happy. An interesting idea here that the Torah makes laws, so to speak, to ensure peace and love between spouses, harmony. You shouldn't have this asymmetrical party. Everyone else is happy and the mother and the father are miserable. Now, the Talmud tells us another law here that the verse says, on the eighth day, the child should be circumcised. What if the eighth day is Shabbos? We know that there's many prohibitions that I'll do on Shabbos. And one of them is to take a knife and to cut flesh. So are we allowed to circumcise the child on Shabbos? The child is born on Saturday. And eight days later, because you count day one, so Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday again, Shabbos again. Eight days later, it's Shabbos again. Could the child be circumcised or must you wait till the following day? So here, this verse tells us, Ubayom meaning on the eighth day, irrespective of what that day of the week is, the child is circumcised. So I, myself was born on a Friday night after nightfall, meaning halakhically it's on Saturday, and I was indeed circumcised on Saturday. Or so I was told, but I believe my parents, I assume that's true. Um, I have a son that was also born on Shabbos and was circumcised on Shabbos. And that's this law that we see over here, that the eighth-day child is circumcised even if it's Shabbos. The law of circumcision overrides the restriction of Shabbos. Now, there are some exceptions here. The Talmud tells us that there is a connection here. The woman is impure for seven. Child is circumcised on day eight. Well, what if the mother does not become impure? So, for example, a woman has a C-section. These laws would not kick, kick in. And therefore, the woman would not, would not have these laws of impurity. And therefore, that child would not be circumcised on Shabbos. The law of circumcision over on Shabbos does not apply in that instance. Another case where a child would not be circumcised on Shabbos is if we are unsure if the baby was born on Shabbos. So, for example, we know that the night is the beginning of the day halachically. So we start Friday night to Shabbos, even though it's not Saturday, but the day, so to speak, begins with the night. But there is this in-between period, a twilight period between Friday and Saturday, and we're not sure is it Friday or is it Saturday halachically. If a child is born during those 72 minutes where we're not sure is it halakhically Friday or halakhically Saturday, we have a little bit of a dilemma. You can't circumcise a child on Friday because maybe the child was actually born on Saturday and therefore Friday will be day seven and you can't circumcise before day eight. You can't circumcise on Shabbos because only circumcision of the eighth day overrides Shabbos. Maybe the child was born really on Friday and therefore Shabbos, the following Shabbos is day nine and circumcision of day nine does not override Shabbos. So a child born in that twilight zone between Friday and Saturday, between Friday and Shabbos, is indeed circumcised on Sunday. It's not day eight for sure. It's a question if it's day nine or day 10, but that is the only solution to such a dilemma. Now the Midrash, on its commentary here in this verse, brings an amazing story between Rabbi Akiva 
and Turnus Rufus, who was one of the governors of the land of Judah after the destruction of the temple. And he used to have these debates with Rabbi Akiva, and there's several of those debates that are recorded in the Talmud and in various Talmudic literature. So the story goes that Turnus Rufus, this Roman general, this Roman governor, he asked Rabbi Akiva, whose deeds, whose actions are greater? The actions of God or the actions of man? So Rabbi Akiva sensed this was a trick question. And he responded to him, no, the actions of man are greater than the actions of God. So Turnus Rufus wasn't ready for that answer. He says, wait a minute. You know, God created the heaven and earth. Can man do that? Of course not. So Rabbi Akiva says, well, that wasn't the question. The question is, in an area where man and God can both operate, which ones are greater? And I say, the actions of man. So that was how Rabbi Akiva initially deflected the conversation. But then Turnus Rufus continued. He says, wait a minute. Why do you circumcise? After all, God delivers babies, so to speak, to us uncircumcised. And you decide that you want to upgrade, so to speak. You want to circumcise the child. Why? So Rekiva said to him, I knew this was your question. And therefore, I preempted you and I said that the actions of man are greater. And I'll bring you proof. So Rekiva goes to the field and pulls out a bushel, a bundle of wheat. He goes to the bakery and takes a loaf of delicious bread. And he says to Turnus Rufus, okay, well, which one of these are greater? You have the wheat that was delivered to us by God in this fashion. You want to eat that or you want to eat the bread, which is when humans, we take our role in processing what God gave us, perfecting and upgrading it from being wheat, from being grain into being bread. Therefore, when we are circumcised as a child is the same kind of thing. God delivers it. It's not perfect. And we have to kind of finish it, do that last mile, fulfill the final touches of the child. Child's uncircumcised. And we just kind of finish that last little bit to create perfection. And then Turnus Rufus asks yet a third question. He says, okay, well, if the child is perfected with circumcision, why doesn't God circumcise them ahead of time? Why doesn't The child arrive circumcised. And finally, the Rekiva responds with a very important, valuable insight into Jewish philosophy because by telling Turnus Rufus that the reason why God gave us mitzvos is that we could perfect ourselves. God, by design, makes us imperfect and the mitzvos are there that we have a role. We could partner with God to perfect ourselves. And therefore, a child is born imperfect We circumcise them on the eighth day and the child is perfected. So if the woman has a a male, she's impure for seven days. If she has a female, she is impure for 14 days. After those days of impurity, there's days of purity. 33 days of purity for a male and 66 days of of purity for a female, meaning that any emissions that she has are not emissions that will render her impure. And then once the entire period is, is commenced, has, has concluded, she brings sacrifices to the temple to complete this cycle, so to speak. And there's two sacrifices. One is an ola, which is an elevation offering, and one is a chatas, a sin offering. Why does a woman have to bring a sin offering after having a baby? What's the sin of having a baby? So the Talmud tells us several reasons. Either because in the throes of labor, we assume that she made a vow. And the vow was, because she's in such pain and agony, she committed to never sleep with her husband again, to never have this terrible experience again. And therefore, as a way to atone for what she maybe might have said, she brings a sin offering. Alternatively, perhaps during her painful labor, she blasphemed against God, going back, so to speak, to the time of Eve. Why did God have to cause this to be such a painful experience? And therefore, as a way to atone that, she brings a sacrifice of atonement to cleanse her from that misdeed that she may have done during her labor and delivery. Now, it's interesting that the description of the sacrifice, like we had uh, previously in Leviticus, there's different sacrifices for a rich person and a poor person. Upon the completion of the days of her purity, she brings a, a, an elevation offering, a young dove or a, or a turtle dove for a sin offering. So, so there's a sheep 
for an elevation offering and a young dove or turtle dove for a sin offering. And then if you read a little bit later on, if she can't afford a sheep, she shall take two turtle doves or two young doves, one for an elevation offering and one for a sin offering. So if you read that, you're like, okay, well, we have the two offerings and depends. If she's rich, she brings a sheep and a turtle dove or dove. And if she's poor, she brings two turtle doves or two young doves. But if you'll notice, if you read this quite critically, you'll notice there's a little bit of a, of a change here in how these birds are presented. In verse 6, it says a young dove or a turtle dove. And in verse 8, meaning in a case where the woman brings two birds and no sheep, it's turtle doves come first, first two turtle doves or two young doves. How come the order is switched? How come in verse 8 it has the turtle doves first, and really everywhere else in the Torah has the turtle doves first, and whereas in verse 6 it has the doves first and only then the turtle doves. So the Balatun, one of the commentaries, I think he says a fascinating idea. He says the difference between verse 6 and verse 8 is that in verse 6, the woman's bringing only one bird, whereas in verse 8, the woman's bringing two birds. And it tells us that if you're only bringing one bird, it's better to bring a dove. Why? Because a turtle dove, and this we already saw a little bit earlier in Leviticus, a turtle dove only has one mate. And after that mate has been killed, they won't be with any other bird. That's just the nature of this turtle dove. And therefore, if you take only one, then in effect, you're breaking up a union that's a lifelong union. And therefore, it's better to take a dove. If you only take one bird, you take a dove. And only if you can't find a dove, you take a turtle dove. It's just an amazing idea of the sensitivity that we're showing over here that we don't want to disrupt even the animals from having a wonderful experience, how sensitive we have to be to not cause pain to animals. And therefore, every other place in the Torah, we're told turtle doves, then doves. But when you're only taking one bird, it's better to take a dove and only then a turtle dove because if you take a turtle dove, then you're going to upend and disrupt some sort of turtle dove union forever. Just an amazing little anecdote here, a little tidbit that we see in the commentaries. So chapter 13 tells us of Saras, a spiritual malady of this day. Now the Talmud tells us, the book of Arachin, that there's seven different sins for which these ailments, these spiritual maladies, Saras comes to a person on Lashon Hara, evil talk, on murder, on oaths in vain, on sexual sins, on haughtiness, on theft, and on being very stingy, being very miserly. And these ailments afflict the body, the clothing, and the house. Our parsha is going to deal with the afflictions of the body and the clothing, and Netri's parsha, parsha's mitzora, is going to cover the laws governing taras on the house. And this is primarily for Lashon Hara, according to the commentary. So, for example, there's a verse in Deuteronomy that tells, we know the story of Miriam. Miriam was the sister of Moshe, Moses, and Aaron. And she spoke negatively about Moses. And there's a verse that tells us that we should remember what God did to Miriam when we left Egypt. That God struck her with Saras, with this ailment, because she spoke negatively about Moses. In fact, it's a mitzvah. In the Torah, says the Ramban in his comment there, it's a mitzvah of the Torah for us to remember the immediate effects that someone speaking Lashon Hara has, uh, at least in the time where the Jewish people are on that spiritual level, that right away there will be a visible spiritual blemish as was present with Miriam. For us, sin has no tangible manifestation on our lives. And the reason why, it's because our soul is a little bit removed from us. You know, our body is okay with sin. In fact, it's even desirous of sin. For us, mitzvos, the activities desired by our soul may feel awkward, a little bit out of place. The more spiritual we get, the more we begin to feel what our soul feels and the more it affects us in a t- tangible and real palpable way. You know, sin is as painful to our soul as injuries are to our body. Without mitzvos, our soul is hungry like our body is hungry without food. And when the Jewish people are in that state, we're close to spiritual perfection. Therefore, the spiritual deficiencies are immediately manifest. And that's the laws of Tzaras. When someone does a sin, either one of those seven sins, but primarily the sin of Lashon Hara, it's going to be immediately reflected in a 
sprouting of tzaras on their body, on their person, or on their garments, or on their home. And what happens, we're given initially an introduction, the first several verses of the uh, of the chapter give us an introduction, and then we go into detail of the various different types of tzaras, and how they are addressed, how they're evaluated, and how they are maybe remediated, as we covered in Parshas Metzorah. So the first thing we see is that when someone has a tzaras, a skin affliction, they have to bring it to the Kohen. Only the Kohen, only the priest, can render a ruling. It will become a tzaras affliction on the skin of his flesh. He shall be brought to Aaron the Kohen, or to one of his sons of the Kohanim. So this is a verse that tells us that the only person that can render a ruling, the only doctor of tzaras, is Aaron and Aaron's children. Now it is interesting. It doesn't mention a generic Kohen. It specifically talks about Aaron and Aaron's children. And why? The question is why? You know, why can't I just say the Cohen? Bring it to the Cohen. Why does it have to say Aaron or Aaron's children? Why does it have to right away go to the most impressive of all the priests, Aaron? And I think the answer is that, you know, someone gets Saras, in effect, it's a direct message from God. You, you did a blunder. You did a sin. And you need to be encouraged to mend your ways and to repent. But you know what's not pleasant to hear? It's not pleasant to hear this kind of criticism. No one wants to hear what they did wrong. No one wants to have their sins listed to them. It's a very difficult thing to absorb. Says the Torah, you go to Aaron. What was Aaron's outstanding quality? That he loved every person. He loved peace. He pursued peace. He did everything he can to make people feel as wonderful, as comfortable as possible and to help them and to encourage them and to give them warmth and give them love. Someone like Aaron. Of course, it's the Kohen. But the Torah hints that you have to have the Aaron attitude to be an effective Kohen vis-a-vis these laws because you're going to have to give the very uncomfortable message to the people who have tzaras. What happens? I'm sorry, you have tzaras. You must have sinned. It's a very difficult thing for a person to hear. You have to harness, the Kohen has to harness their internal Aaron quality where they genuinely are interested in the the betterment, the well-being of the people that they're talking to Someone who has that attitude, indeed, they will be effective. You have to be like Aaron in order to render judgment. If the priest rules that the person is contaminated, then they have to go in isolation. They have to go outside the camp and they have to contemplate what they did. And of course, this is part of a repentance process. You think about what you did, you dwell upon it, and hopefully you'll mend your ways. And then the illness, which was only a manifestation of the spiritual malady, will go away too. The symptoms will disappear with the cause disappearing. Someone who speaks slanderously about other people, someone who sows division, has to be sent outside to isolation. You cause division, therefore you are divided away from other people. You have to warn other people to stay away from you. You're not allowed to walk within the four cubits of another person. You're excommunicated. And all that, these are not punishments. These are means to encourage repentance, encourage expiation, encourage someone to evaluate what they did, to contemplate what, what they are and their actions, their deeds, and hopefully to amend them, to fix them. There are cases where the Cohen is not certain. Is this Saras? Is it not Saras? Such a person will be quarantined for seven days or maybe an additional seven days. And you read the chapter, there's different kinds of colors. There's different shades. There's laws governing burns or inflammations. Is the wound oozing? Is it stabbed over? Saras on the head, on the face. Was there hair there? Is there bald spots in the front, in the back? Is it a normal skin disease? Is it saras? These are some of the laws that we see over here. And I think instead of going into the nitty-gritty detail of all these laws, I want to try to focus on what lessons that we could draw. So, for example, verse 13 of chapter 13 gives us a very interesting situation. What if someone's entire body is totally covered with saras, with this skin malady? So the law is that they are actually rendered as being pure. And as an aside, this proves conclusively that this is not about leprosy. If someone is completely covered with leprosy, then they're ever more dangerous, ever more they should be isolated from the rest of the people. Clearly, it's a spiritual disease. And therefore, for some reason, when the person is entirely spiritually covered with saras, then they're pure. So what's the rationale behind that? So the Kliyakha, one of the commentaries, tells us that after all, the entire purpose of the Tsaras is to coax 
someone to repent. If someone has it on every square inch of their body, for sure they repented, and therefore you don't need to go through the whole process because the person has surely repented. And the Talmud actually tells us an amazing idea in the book of Sanhedrin, page 97a. It says that Messiah will come in one of two different ways, either a generation that's entirely righteous or a generation that's entirely wicked. And it proves it from this verse. What does it mean that if the generation is entirely wicked, that Messiah will come? That generation is obviously wicked. So why would Messiah come in such, to such a people? Says the Talmud, quotes our verse, if everything is impure, if the entirety of his skin has been cov- covered in white, then such a person is indeed pure. And therefore, if the entire generation has been covered in impurity, then Messiah will come. And my grandfather explained the idea behind this is that for impurity to reign, you have to have a little bit of purity. If there's not a scintilla of purity, if there's nothing good, then the bad cannot flourish. And this is an interesting idea that when society devolves and devolves and devolves and devolves to such a degree that there's nothing good left, then it implodes upon itself. It has nothing to give it life, has no truth uh, that it could grasp upon, and therefore the whole thing ceases to exist, and the evil disappears, and all you have left is good. An amazing insight that we see here in the idea of purity and impurity. There has to be a little bit of purity in the impurity for the impurity to have vitality and continuity. Now, there's another interesting idea that we see here in verse 19, what happens when someone is healed and then on the place where the inflammation was, meaning where the heal, where, where the person was healed, then there was another manifestation of, of the Sarah. So the person had an illness, it was healed, and then they're having a second illness. Maybe the idea behind this is, you know, someone has an illness and they get healed. Their job is to focus, what did I do wrong to get this bruise to get this ailment and how do I make sure it doesn't happen again? And therefore, if someone has an illness and specifically in that same place, a second illness sprouts, the lesson that they forgot was to do a post-illness reckoning. They forgot to examine their deeds afterwards and therefore they're reminded again, don't forget about this because you may have the same problem if you don't address the underlying cause of that problem. There's another interesting law here in uh, in chapter 13, and that's the bohawk, which is uh, certain white spots on the skin that are not impure. They do not render the person as a mitzvah, someone who has tzaras. Yet, we're told in the verse, in verse 38, that the person needs to show it to the Kohen, and the Kohen will declare that he is pure. Now, the question is, if the person is pure, then why would you need to show it to the Kohen? Maybe the answer to that is, you know, even things that are not fully saras, if you have things that change in your life, if you have suddenly have white spots sprouting, it's probably a good idea to do some soul searching. Yes, it's not saras, but we have to find out what it is and hopefully address it before it gets out of hand. So we're, we're given all these laws governing how to, someone is rendered into a mitzora, into someone who has saras. And then in verse 45 and 46, we're told what has to happen to them. And the person with saras in whom there is an affliction, his garments shall be rent. You've got to cut your garments. His hair shall be unshorn, no haircuts. He shall cloak himself up to his lips. He shall call out, contaminate, contaminate. He to warn everyone that he's contaminated. All the days of his affliction are upon him. He shall remain contaminated. He is contaminated. He shall dwell in isolation. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Again, this is all means to help him recognize what he did, recognize what brought him to that, and hopefully fix it so that way he'll solve his problem and eventually the manifestation will go away as well. There's an interesting Ibn Ezra here, comment uh, on this idea, on this verse, that the laws governing a Mitzorah, someone at Saras, are very similar to the laws governing someone who is a Avel, who is a mourner. And he tells us that the reason why someone who has saras has to mourn, they're not mourning on 
the symptom they have to mourning they have to mourn on the activities that brought them the symptoms and i think maybe this is a powerful idea if something bad happens to us we're sad what the ibn Ezra would tell us is that we have to be sad not because of the consequence of our action not because of what happened to us but because of what actually caused that and using that attitude of thinking what did i do wrong to deserve this that will hopefully lead us to fix that and to rectify it and solve the cause of the symptoms and not just dwell and ruminate on the symptoms itself. And then verse 47, we read about what happens when a garment has tsaras. It could be a fabric. It could be a leather garment. It could be tsaras in the various different ways that the uh, the warp and the roof, which which means essentially the way these things are woven. There's They're woven horizontally and vertically into a garment, if someone has tsaras, if someone has a, again, the spiritual affliction on their garment, uh, they're, again, like an individual has on their skin, they're quarantined, and depending upon the circumstances of the garment, the garment's either declared pure, uh, or it's cleaned, and if it goes away, then great, it could be completely burnt if it doesn't go away, or other instances that only the part what which was discolored is torn out and burned, but the rest of the garment is okay. Parsha's Mitzora. So the Parsha begins, Hashem said to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the Mitzora on the day of his purification. We're talking now about the purification. He has been contaminated, he's repented, and now it's time for him to be purified. As an introduction to some of the themes of the Parsha, there is a beautiful statement from the great Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Israel Meir Hakohen Kagan, known by the name of his book, the book called Chafetz Chaim. He was, of course, a great sage, lived at the end of the 19th and the early part of the 20th century. And his hallmark was his incredible, meticulous fastidiousness in not speaking any Lashon Hara. And he's, of course, named after his book, Chafetz Chaim, which means seeker of life, based upon a verse in the book of Psalms, which says, who is the one who seeks life, who wants long days? Someone who guards your mouth from speaking any evil. So he was the one who assembled and collected and clarified and codified and canonized all the laws related to Lashon Hara to, towards evil talk. And he has a very nice homiletic teaching on this first verse of our parsha. This shall be the law of the Metzora. In Hebrew, this reads, Zotihiya Torah HaMetzorah. This is the Torah of the Mitzorah, beyond Torah on the day of his purification. So the way we read it simply is that this is the laws governing the Mitzorah, governing the person who has Saras on the day that he wants to expiate himself from Saras on the day of his purification. Says the Chavetz Chaim, there's another way to read this. This is the Torah of the Mitzorah. When does someone who has speech Lashon Hara, when do they have Torah? When is their Torah vibrant and alive? Beyond Tara so on the day of their purification, once they cleanse themselves from Tsaras and from the sins that engendered Tsaras, then they could have Torah. How so? We study Torah with our power of speech. When someone speaks Lashon Hara, Lashon Hara literally means evil tongue. They are sullying their faculties of speech, their tongue, their lips, their teeth. They're sullying them with sin. That person goes to study Torah, their mouth's contaminated. How could you study the Almighty's Torah with sullied, sinful, evil mouth? It's not possible. Therefore, we read, this is the Torah of the Mitzvah. When does the Mitzvah have Torah? On the day that they are purified. There's a powerful idea that when someone has Lashon Hara, the power of speech, the, va- the power of verbal, oral communication is curtailed. Anything that you want to do with your speech, like studying Torah, now you can't really do it. It's going to be weakened. Similarly, we see with prayer. Of course, we pray to God and we hope that our prayer is efficacious. But if our prayer is emanating from lips, from tongues that are weakened, that are sullied, that have been rendered impure and contaminated by sin, by the sin of the speech, the sin of Lashon Hara, how can we come to God? How could that mouth be an effective conduit towards verbal prayer. 
Okay, but now hopefully he's been purified. And what's the halacha? The Kohen goes out and the Kohen inspects him. Just like the Kohen was the one who rendered him impure, who evaluated his situation and said this person's impure, now the Kohen is going to render him pure by examining the Tsaras, it's been healed. Okay, now begins a very long, a week long, a little more than a week in fact, process of purification. On the first day, the Kohen shall command, the person should be purified, and they have to assemble the materials. Two live, clean birds, these birds can be any kosher birds, cedar wood, crimson thread, and hyssop. That's what, these are the ingredients that are going to be used for the purification. Well, what do you do with these things? One of the birds is slaughtered in an earthenware vessel together with some water. And then you have a live bird in the other hand. So you have one dead bird and its blood is in a vessel, a basin. You take the live bird together with the three other themes. The cedar wood comes from a very tall tree. The crimson thread that comes from a a worm uh, that you dye the the wool in. And the hyssop is a, is, a, is a very, is a it's like grass. And you take those themes, you wrap them together. So you have a live bird and three other items that grow from the ground. You dip them into the blood, and then you take this concoction, this cocktail, and you sprinkle it seven times upon the person who's been purified, on the pers- upon the person who just a day earlier was the Metzora, was someone who had Saras. After this very unusual ceremony, the person is purified, or at least the initial stage of the purification have been done. And then you take that live bird, and you release it, you free it, into the open field. And then the first of uh, several of these events are going to happen. The person purifies, washes his clothing, washes his body, shaves off all his hair, and enters the camp. He is now allowed to go back into the camp, even though he's not allowed to go into his tent. So he's allowed into the camp, but it's kind of like a halfway house. Initially, well, previously, when he was a Mitsura, full Mitsura, he was outside the camp. Now, the first day after his purification, he's allowed to go into the camp, but is still not allowed to go into his tent and is still not allowed to engage in any marital intercourse uh, for the duration of his seven days of purification. So a lot of really bizarre, at least initially, processes that we're doing here with this Mitzvah. So Rashi, of course, explains the deep meaning and the powerful insight that is derived by all these uh, very unusual ingredients that are assembled for this purification process. So it begins with two live, clean birds. Says Rashi, why does the person have tsaras? What sin caused them to be stricken with this illness? They spoke Lashon Hara. Like a bird that couldn't stop jabbering, yammering, and chirping. Therefore, this is what he sinned with, this is what is needed to purify him. The Baal HaTurim tells us something interesting. He says, just like a bird, a bird, it has, of course, a nest, but then it flies away. Similarly, someone who's Shon Hara is going to be nomadic. Like a bird, he's going to be uprooted from his place and placed in a different location, away from everyone else, alone, to dwell and to wallow upon his condition why he got there, to think about why he got there. Okay, so those are the birds. Well, what about the cedar wood? Says Rashi, the cedar wood is a result of the fact that the cedar is a very high tree. And the reason, the core characteristic as to why this person spoke negatively about other people, it's because he was aloof. He was above everyone. He was haughty. He was arrogant. He had hubris. He was tall and mighty like the cedar tree. And consequently, he looked down at everyone else. He denigrated them. He viewed them as being inferior to him. And that's why this sin sprung upon him. And that's why the result, the tsaras, cleaved to him. Now, it's interesting the splotches of Tsaras, the color that we saw last week, is it's a white color. And the obvious question is, you know, in, in, in Jewish literature, white is always associated with purity. In fact, on, on, on Yom Kippur, we try to, we all, we wear white and we try to atone like white. And then the verse tells us that if our sins are red, well, God will whiten them. Why is the symbol of impurity of contamination, why is that white too? Maybe this is the answer. 
someone who speaks negatively about other people, they view themselves as being just, themselves as being righteous. They are white. And in fact, this may be, in fact, an area in which they are white. They are, so to speak, better than the person that they are denigrating. But even if you're better than someone, it doesn't mean you speak negatively about them. So yes, you are better, but you know what? That whiteness, that purification, that righteousness that you have, if you express it in the wrong way, in a Lashon Hara fashion, it's going to sprout up as white splotches and render you impure. So those are the first two ingredients. The next ingredients are crimson thread and hyssop. These are very low themes, either low like a worm or low like this this grass. And therefore, the lesson that the person who is the Mitzorah is supposed to deduce is that they have to lower themselves. They have to humble themselves. That is a way for them to repent and to atone for the deeds that brought them to this point. Now, why are they sprayed seven times? The Balaturim says that's a reference to the seven sins for which a person could get saras. And finally, why is one bird slaughtered and one bird sent away? So this is also an indication, also a lesson for the Metzora, that just as the one bird that was slaughtered is not coming back, so too your tsaras is not coming back. However, a second bird is sent away. And that's a reference that if the person goes back to his sinful ways, just like there's the, that bird is still alive, so too the potential for him to have Saras is still alive. He could still get it. A second reason why the, sec- the second bird is released is to show that when someone speaks to if someone sees bad talk, just like it's very hard to recage a released bird, it's very hard to catch, so to speak, to undo, to reverse the damage that was done with Lashon Hara. So the person has been atoned for at least the initial stages. Now it is seven days they spend inside the camp in that halfway house. And verse 9 we read, On the seventh day shall shave off all his hair, his head, his beard, his eyebrows, and all of his hair again, we read. Um, so not only to say all of his hair, it gives us specifics, his head, his beard, and his eyebrows. So Rashi tells us so that's a reference. Only the visual parts, the parts that are visualized to the naked eye. In addition, he immerses his clothing, he washes his clothing, immerses his flesh in water, and then the next stage of his purification, he becomes pure. Why does it mention specifically the head, the hair on the head, the hair on the beard, and the hair on the eyebrows? So perhaps this symbolizes the three areas in which the sin of Lashon Hara is most pronounced. Someone's head, that's where they feel their haughtiness, their aloofness, shave that hair. Someone's beard, beard after all, surrounds the mouth. The mouth, of course, is the vehicle for the speech of slander and gossip. And the eyes, the eyes, well, they're a reference to the envy, which perhaps motivated his antisocial behavior. So now it's been seven days of atonement, and then the final stage of purification is day eight. Day eight, he takes two unblemished male lambs and a unblemished you and some flour and some oil and he comes to the tent of meeting so of course that's the mission of the tabernacle and eventually this is the temple once there's a permanent place of god's shrine to dwell it's the temple and this is brought as various offerings to god now because he is still in a quasi state of purity he doesn't walk all the way in He is at the entrance of the tent of meeting because he's not fully purified. He can't actually walk in. He still has to stand outside. And then we read about the processing of these sacrifices. First, the Kohen slaughters the lamb. He takes the blood and he does something very unusual with it. He places it on three parts of the Mitzorah, the, per- the erstwhile Mitzorah's body, one on the ear, the right ear, one on the thumb, which is on the right hand, and one of the big toe, which is on his right foot. If you've been listening intently for the past couple of weeks, you'll remember that that process was also done to the priests, to the Aaron and his children on the first day of their initiation. We read that a few weeks ago. So that's the first thing that is done. Then we take the oil, and the oil is sprinkled upon 
the uh, in the direction of the Holy of Holies. Some of the remaining oil is put on those same three locations, just the air, just like the blood of the sacrifice is put on the ear and the right thumb and the big toe on the right foot. So too, the oil from that part of the sacrifice is also put on those same three locations. And if there's any leftover oil, it's poured on the head of the individual who is being purified. And then the second sacrifice is offered, and this shall complete the atonement of someone who was a Metzorah. Now, just like we had with sacrifices in the beginning of Leviticus, we have over here, by this particular set of sacrifices, there is one prescription for someone who is a little bit wealthier and could afford more expensive animals for sacrifices. And then verse 21, we read about how this process is done for someone who is poor who cannot afford those same expensive animals. Now, it's important to stress, today, we don't have tzaras. We're not at that same spiritual level in which our sins are immediately manifest in a tangible way. But of course, we still have Lashon Hara, and therefore the spiritual blemish that results from someone speaking Lashon Hara is still present. The Talmud tells us, in the book of Arachin, page 15b, what is the atonement of people who speak Lashon Hara? Says the Talmud, if, if that person is a Torah scholar, you should study Torah, if you're not a Torah scholar, your cure is to humble yourself. And the idea being, just as Lashon Hara, that breeds impurity contamination in your mouth, what is the one thing that you could do to overpower that? What is the one thing that you could do to use your mouth for something holy and to cleanse, so to speak, the mouth? Well, you use that same mouth for holiness for Torah, and that will hopefully undo the damage that was rendered by the sin of Lashon Hara. And then in verse 33, we read about a new kind of tzaras, tzaras when it appears not on your body, not on your garments, but on your home. Now the Midrash tells us, why do we have to have three different types of tzaras? Says the Midrash, there's a certain progression. When someone speaks Lashon Hara or does some of these other sins, initially, the tzaras happens on their home. It's a little bit removed from them. And the, ho- the hope is that when it appears in their home, they'll take the message. They won't say, oh, you know what? This is something, this is some mold. This is something that occurs naturally anyhow. They'll take the lesson to heart. They'll absorb the teaching. They'll apply to themselves. They'll fix what it is that was broken and the tzaras will go away and they'll be better off. If the person does not fix it initially, well, then it'll get a little closer. It's not in their home. It's on their garment. It's, it's very close and it, the lesson should be more powerful. If they don't listen to that, if they continue their evil ways, finally, Tsaras will appear on their body. Again, we see that the objective here is not one of punishment, but one of, of, of awakening the person to the evil of his ways and hopefully they will mend those evil ways. So the section begins... Hashem spoke to Moses and to Aaron, telling the Jewish people, When you arrive in the land of Canaan that I give you as a possession, I will place a tzaras affliction upon a house in the land of your possession. So there's a certain preamble over here. When you arrive in the land of Canaan, then you have tzaras affliction upon the house. So the simple understanding is that these laws, the laws of tzaras on the home, they're applicable only after Jewish people conquer the entire land of Israel. Whereas the other tzaras, tzaras on the garment and on your body, that is already present prior before the conquest of Canaan, before the Jewish people settle into the land of Canaan. That's the simple understanding. You look at Rashi. Rashi says something very novel, and initially it sounds a little bit unusual. It says Rashi, this is a tiding that when the Jewish people enter the land of Israel, they will have tzaras in their home. Why? There's a very good reason for this. Because the Amorites, these are the people that lived there prior, they heard about the Jewish people and they were terrified of the Jewish people. And for 40 years, for the duration of Jewish people's tenure in the wilderness, these Amorites were hiding all their valuables, all their gold behind their walls. They will steer the Jewish people. Jewish people come. We want to make sure that our valuables are protected. They hid them behind the walls. Jewish people move into the homes previously inhabited by these Amorites. And what happens? A 
affliction of Tsaras appears in the wall. Part of the laws are that you have to dismantle the home or at least take away some of those bricks that were afflicted. So it's almost like the Almighty is going to pinpoint exactly where the gold is. And he's going to make this magical Tsaras affliction on the walls of the home. Eventually, the Jewish people will have to dismantle at least that section. And you know what? They'll discover the hidden riches. So there's a very interesting idea here. There's a lot, a few, maybe a few ways to go with this. But one of the ideas here is that sometimes the money wants to make us wealthy. But perhaps there's good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. It's possible that this individual, he was going to become wealthy regardless of what happened. But because he may have had some sins, the Almighty says, okay, I'm going to make him wealthy in this fashion where he is going to be simultaneously rewarded because he's supposed to have wealth for whatever reason. But he's also going to be reminded that you need to repent from your ways and he's given the Tsaras and he, you kill two birds with one stone because his wealth is achieved and his punishment, or at least his reminder, is also achieved in this same fashion. But it's possible if the person was not a sinner, they would have still gotten the wealth, but they would have gotten it in a more pleasant way, in a way that did not have with it the shame, the degradation of having your home afflicted with Tsaras. So that's an interesting introduction that we see here from Rashi, that Saras on the home is not necessarily an entirely bad omen. It could portend to something very valuable. There could be some hidden gold and valuables behind the wall that was afflicted with Saras. So that's the introduction here. So what happens? Someone who has this sign on their home, they come and they tell the Kohen, something like an affliction has appeared to me in the house. So the diagnosis is one that is presented kind of hesitatingly. Something like an affliction, he comes to the Kohen, of course the Kohen has to oversee it, but he doesn't tell him an affliction appeared. He says, something that kind of looks like an affliction has appeared on the walls of my home. Says Rashi, why does he say in that kind of hesitating tone, even if someone is supremely knowledgeable, he's a great scholar, and he knows to differentiate between a real sign of Tzras and a fake one, he still should have the humility to not render a final ruling and say, affliction appears. Say, no, it seems like it's an affliction. It appears like it. I'm not so sure. And the Talmud tells us that a person should always train themselves to say, I don't know. It's a good thing to train yourself. Maybe that's the idea over here, that even though someone may be a Torah scholar, when they present their findings, when they present their evidence, the Kohen, they should say it in somewhat of an uncertain fashion. In fact, as rabbis, we are trained that whenever there's a matter of a judgment call, we should avoid saying it's not good, it's problematic. Don't necessarily render a ruling. Why? So of course there's the humility component we just spoke about a second ago. There's a second component, and that is that once a ruling is rendered with finality, with definitiveness, it cannot be undone willy-nilly. And therefore, if you have a rabbi who's presented a halachic query, and you can maybe see it go both ways, but you're kind of leaning that it's not good, you say, it doesn't appear to me good, I cannot permit it, but maybe you'll find some other rabbi who can. And that's maybe another idea over here, that unless you're the coin, unless you're the final authority on this issue, don't say anything definitive, because once you say something definitive, it might be halachically difficult to rever- to reverse that, to undo that. So the Kohen arrives at the home, and before he arrives, everything in the house is brought outside of the house. Why? Because if the Kohen is in the house, and the house is full of furniture and full of all kinds of stuff, and the Kohen says, well, this is impure, this is actually Tsaras, this home has been afflicted with this contamination, everything that is inside the house has now suffered and is now considered impure. And therefore, before the coin comes, before he renders a ruling, everything is taken outside the house, so they should not be contaminated by the ruling, if it is indeed a ruling, that it's impure. So if you think about that, this adds another wrinkle to this process, because now it's not just a question of, is my house okay or not? 
It's a question of all the neighbors now see all my furniture piled outside in the front yard. And that, of course, adds a degree of pain. And maybe that is linked to all the other emotions that the Mitzvah is supposed to have. The component of shame, of being divided from his folk, from his neighbors, that is maybe by design, everyone kind of sees that there's something wrong in this home. So the Kohen does not render a final ruling. He sees in the walls, in the plaster, he sees various colors, greens, reds. He leaves the house and he quarantines the house for a seven-day period. After seven days, the Kohen returns and re-examines the affliction, re-examines the splotches on the wall. If they spread, then indeed the house has been contaminated, and those stones upon which there is these afflictions, they have to be removed, and they have to be deposited out of the city in in a contaminated place. These stones are forever unusable. The entire surrounding stones and plaster has to be scraped away, and again deposited out of the city in a contaminated place, and you take new stones and they're placed in the voids left by the previous stones, you again replaster the more of the house, and then you wait and see what happens again. You wait seven more days, and after seven days you re-examine the home. If the affliction has returned, and it's erupted in the home, even in the location where the new stones had replaced the existing stones, then the home must be demolished. All parts of the home, the stones, the timber, the mortar, everything is deposited out to the city. The entire home is dismantled and you cannot come into the home. This is a, a location, a venue of impurity. If anyone comes, they become contaminated as well. Whereas if the coin comes and he sees that the affliction has not spread, then he renders the home to be purified the affliction's been healed, and again, the purification process, like it was outlined previously with regards to the Mitzorah on their body, there is a purification process for the Mitzorah, for the, mitzorah, for the Shiraz of the home. You take a bird, and you take another bird, and again, you have those other ingredients, the, the cedar, the hyssop, the crimson thread, and you dip it in, you spray it on the home, and that concludes these laws, the laws of Tsaras, both of, of your garments, both of your body, and of course, one on your home. So that's the conclusion of the laws of Tsaras. The rest of the Parsha, chapter 15, deals with a different kind of impurity, namely that of Zav and Balkeri and Zava and Zavagdola and Nida. These are various emissions that come out of the genitalia, both male and female. There is a, a seminal emission, there is menstruation, and then there's other emissions a Zav and a Zava, which is a man who has an emission from the, his genitalia, but that's not a seminal emission, it's a different kind of emission. And then there's a Zava, which is an irregular emission that comes out of a woman. And uh, the basic breakdown over here is that uh, when there is a discharge from a man, he becomes a uh, what's called a balkari, he has to go to the mikvah, he has to go to, to, to the ritual immersion. He is impure until sundown. If there is a different kind of discharge, a different kind of fluid, he becomes pure after having seven clean days. If there's three discharges of that same fluid, either if that was done three times in one day or three consecutive days, again, he has to have seven clean days and has to bring offerings. And then there's the female discharges the female emissions, the nida is a menstruation, and the zava is a different kind of discharge that is more irregular, and there is a minor one and a major one. And this, in fact, our parsha deals with the laws of purity and impurity, but today, part of these laws are still very relevant, and that is when a woman is menstruating, she becomes prohibited to her husband until The bleeding stops and she goes to the mikvah, she goes to the ritual immersion. And today, when we have our laws, what's called family purity, it's actually a mixture of the laws of Anita and the laws of a Zava, because it's not so clear what actually a Zava is. What is that emission? It's, it's a, it's kind of complicated. And the Talmud already says 
that a regular case of Anita adopts some of the stringencies of a Zava Gedola. Thus concludes Parshas Mitzora. Thank you so much for listening. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.